Fantastic. Thank you, Bill. Welcome to my to my session. Delightful to be here. Well, delightful to be at an in-person conference again. It's absolutely fantastic. Love the room in it so far. Uh, yeah, so I'm Sath Bal Singh. For those of you who don't know me, uh, you can tell I'm from Scotland. I'm from Edinburgh. I've come a long way. Uh, and uh, something, something very different. I'm going to be talking about the power of purpose. A little bit about me, obligatory slide. Yeah, I've been doing this quite a long time now. I know you wouldn't think it to look at me. Uh, yeah, 20 odd years, uh, technology background. I started as a software engineer a long time ago now. I used to be a Perl programmer, if any of you know what that is. Uh, and then I moved from that into sort of tech lead, managerial, strategic leadership roles, where I've kind of mostly been for the last 12, 15 years. Um, and at the moment, I work in the financial services sector and I sit at the I often say I sit at the intersection of agile engineering and communities. Because a lot of what I do is I build engineering communities. And as I'm in a bank, you know, we have thousands and thousands of engineers for the large communities. Uh, and I spend a lot of my time trying to nurture those communities and, and help improve the collaborative culture. So that's really what I'm interested in. That's a lot of what I do. Uh, a little bit more about my agile history. I, I, again, I think somebody said it earlier, I had early brushings with XP when I started as a dev long time ago, and yeah, I'm not going to go through the rest of it. I'm currently the, the chair of the BCS Agile Methods. I took over from our good friend, Jose, who, who was the chair for many years, and he also founded that specialist group. So what we're covering today, um, so what I'm going to be talking about, so I'm going to do a bit of a scene set. I'm going to talk a little bit about social leadership, social age. That's something I talked about last year. So my talk really builds on that. It's a new talk. I've not done it before. I wrote it for this conference, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about power, of all things, and then how does purpose fit into that, uh, and then share some own personal reflections. And I'm going to have a few closing remarks, and hopefully we might have some time for questions. See how we go. That's uh, so why. Don't worry, I'm not going to be talking about the Golden Circle. Most of you recognise that from Simon Sinek. But why? Well, why am I doing this talk? Well, it's a reflective talk. You know, a lot of my talks tend to be that way. Uh, and I wrote an article in 2021 just reflecting on a lot of what many of us had experienced over the last few years. And uh, yeah, it got me thinking about a whole bunch of things. And the article was actually called The Power of Purpose. So I thought, why not turn it into a talk? It might be an interesting talk. And it's based on my, my experiences, my journey, my journey into the space of social leadership. Uh, and also some other sort of personal reflections that I'll share later. And it's something I'm very passionate about, uh, is this whole idea of where we are, different leadership styles changing, but also how we change. How do we change over time? What, what, what causes us to change? What shifts our mindset? And that's something I'm always very interested and curious about. So that's what I'm really, this is why I've written this talk. Uh, so a quick recap, I did this talk last year at, at the virtual Lean Agile Global, um, and it was about social leadership, which was something I was kind of exploring at the time and applying in my own workplace, um, in the org that I'm in. So just to set the scene, social leadership, so social age, that's where we are now. That's the current place we're in. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we started in, so we've emerged into the social age. So we came from, say, like the manufacturing age, where humans typically were interested in creating things, building things. And then we moved into more of a knowledge age, uh, where it was much more around, you know, acquiring knowledge, literature, academia, that type of thing. And then we moved into the digital age. Uh, where technology was very ubiquitous and we went from, you know, the, the, the dawn of the internet through to, you know, the desktop PCs uh, and then, you know, the power of the, the technology we carry around in our pockets, our smartphones. And a lot of, there was an assumption that we'd reached the end, right? We've got to the end, it's technology age, but that isn't the end. That wasn't the end. We moved into the social age and social age is less about technology, social platforms. It's more around driving meaning. It's more about making sense of things because a lot of us look to really derive meaning now. I mean, we're overwhelmed by the amount of content and information that's out there and bombarding us. And we have to make conscious choices about you know, what we're going to shut out and what we're actually interested in. And, and it takes a lot of effort to do that. It takes a lot of effort to do that. And that's what this is all really about. It's also changed the, the nature of work. Uh, work's completely changed now. You work from anywhere, you work from everywhere. But we've had topics like you know, the great resignation, et cetera. Uh, and communication is changing. It continues to change. We now you know, live in an age of liberal communication. We've got all the platforms, we've got all the technology, you just say what you want, right? And then that's why we've ended up with terms like fact-checking because people are just saying whatever, right? And you've really got to think about 
you know, is this true? How does, what does this mean for me? How do I relate to this? So everything's contextual. Everything's about deriving meaning. And that's what social age is about. And social contracts, you know, the way we interact with each other has changed, the way we interact with our employers has changed. Um, employers now understand that, you know, there's different expectations of their employees. A lot of us are now driven by purpose, right, which I'm going to talk about more shortly. And we're value driven, so we're looking for alignment between our values and those of our employers. And also employers understand that they have to really get that right now to actually be an attractive employer. So all these things are happening, all these things have changed, and that's all given rise to the social leader. So I'm going to talk about what the social leader looks like in a second. But it's this era we're in, this era of like liberal communication, of trying to derive meaning, and, and the way that we interact has changed. That's where the social leaders have, have risen from. And social leaders are very interested in creating social spaces. Social spaces, spaces where we can learn, we can collaborate, and they're looking to tap into the unheard voices and surface them and give everybody the platform to share and use that to, to gain common consensus. Do that through communities. So social leaders are in the communities, they're sharing their messages in communities. This is what a social leader typically looks like. These are the characteristics of a social leader. So I've just talked about social capital. Social leaders have high social capital, very high social capital. They're good. They know how to interact. They know how to build relationships, create meaningful relationships. Um, and these other traits are, again, they weren't traits that we associated with leaders in the past. But in the age we're in now, um, and we talk about things like quiet leadership, which is also something I've studied a little bit, you get ideas like kindness, fairness, humility, grace, interesting, challenging concepts. But leaders now, they, they just try to present themselves where they're actually embracing these types of ideas. And they're less based on their authority. So the reputation grows and they gain their authority. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in the next slide about how that happens, why that happens, what that looks like. And they have these common behaviours. Collaboration's key to them. They're highly collaborative. They want to be highly collaborative. They want to develop and nurture communities. Uh, and they're really interested in creating the right kind of environment for everyone. So we, we talk a lot about diversity, equality, inclusion, all these sorts of important key topics now. Social leaders are at the heart of that. And they're creating spaces, as I mentioned. And they're great storytellers. They create the right narrative. And above all else, social leaders are very keen to develop other leaders. That's what, that, that's what makes them great leaders. This is the NET model. So I talked a lot about this in my previous talk. Um, this is by a wonderful chap called Julian Stodd. Julian Stodd is a thought leader in uh, community development, social leadership, uh, storytelling, and it's his work. I've studied a lot of my work is influenced and inspired by his work. Uh, so this NET model, its name is derived from the three key dimensions there. Narrative, engagement, technology. I'm not going to go through it in great detail because I, I, don't, I don't have time, but really the idea is this is the journey that a social leader goes on. And you start with the narrative, right? So you start at the end and you work your way around. And it's, it's, it's powerful. You know, I, I've kind of studied it. I've tried to apply it and practice it. And it takes time and effort to practice. And you've got to keep doing these things as one often does. But the whole point is you, you create the right narrative. You share it in the right sort of spaces. And through that, you know, if it lands and the storytelling is powerful and it connects with people in those communities, your message gets amplified. And through that amplification, this, the, the social leader will see growth in their reputation and that's what gives them power. Yeah? That's what gives them power. What role does power play in social leadership? Well, social leaders aren't interested in power per se. It's not what they're interested in at all. They're interested in achieving something. They're driven by a purpose. And through all this stuff and the work that they do and the way they carry themselves, they gain power. But power is not what they're interested in. It's not what motivates and drives them. But what's power? So I find power quite a, a complex of abstract kind of concept. Again, I did a workshop with Julian and I was, you know, I was in some breakout rooms and we were talking about it. And for me, power always sort of strikes up these sort of negative connotations. But it isn't necessarily entirely the case. This is an inquiry framework. I've captured it like this for this talk. Um, and again, it, it's something that Julian created. I, I came by it last year, and I'll share some references at the end. Um, but it's, it's, um, I find it very powerful. So it's a kind of inquiry framework, he calls it. And uh, there's these four, four key aspects of it on the left. They're kind of like really four different lenses through which you might examine power as a concept. Just think about the mechanism of it. What's, what's the impact of your own power? 
uh, the shape of your power, what might that look like? And the one I'm kind of intrigued by a lot is the fragility of our power. So I'm not going to go through all the questions on the right, but as you can see, they're very powerful coaching style questions. So if you sit there and looked at them yourself and thought about them and maybe, you know, tried to you know, scribble something or write some notes, you, you'd start to kind of elicit some thoughts of your own around, you know, what this stuff means for you. I'll pick out a few. Um, so what can we achieve alone? Well, in my experience, not a great deal. We kind of grow together, don't we? We collaborate together, we succeed together. No one really succeeds alone. Well, I've never experienced much growth or success doing anything on my own because it's a team sport more often than not. Uh, what limits our power? Well, that's going to that's vary for each of us. It's going to differ. For me, it's probably my imposter syndrome. So Scott and I talked last year at Agile 20 Reflect about imposter syndrome, and yeah, I suffer from imposter syndrome. It takes a lot for me to prepare myself to well, even to do this sort of thing. Uh, but for you, it'll be different, and there'll be other ones that, you know, if I were to spend more time thinking about it, yeah, I'm sure other things would come up. The impact of our power. What harm can you prevent? I like that one. Yeah, what good could we do in the world? How could we use our power to prevent harm? Yeah, I like that, because harm, again, yeah, difficult concept, doesn't conjure kind of nice connotations. But, you know, we all have the power to prevent harm and do good. Yeah, you could probably think of your own examples or, you know, how might you choose to do that? How do you do that now? The shape of power. Yeah, it's quite an interesting one. What has been given to you? Yeah, I've thought about that one quite a lot. What do I have? I think I have opportunity, really. I have an opportunity. Well, I'm linking the, the, the previous one and this one. I have an opportunity. Opportunities, we're privileged. We have a chance to, to, to do a great deal of good. And I think that's really how our, that, that is often the shape of our power. And the last one I talked about, the fragility of our power. I think for me, this one's really you're starting to get into the territory of sort of vulnerability. What's our vulnerabilities? What do we look like when we're vulnerable? How do we show up? How do we manage that? How do we cope with that? How do we deal with that? Do we mask it? Do we share it? Yeah, good leaders as well. Social leaders tend to be very good at sharing and expressing the vulnerability. We're not all good at that. Uh, what do you fear? Yeah, what do we fear? I think that is a good link to, to power. I think a lot of us, we always fear something, right? Various for each of us differently in this context right now. I might fear that this talk isn't landing with any of you. But we all fear different things. So I find this very powerful. I think it can apply on an individual level. You can apply it at a team level. You can apply it at an organizational level. Um, and I think it's a great way also to think about your own leadership style, the way you show up, um, the way your leadership can, 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 can do good and can be effective. And, I, and, I, and I've kind of tried to use it in this way. But I'm early on in my journey in this. It's quite new. There's a, there's a, there's a link to a book I'll share at the end. And it's only just come out. And Julian is talking about a lot of this stuff. And it really speaks to me. It appeals to me. So where does purpose fit in? Yeah, just quick Google search, quick definitions. I like the second one, a person's sense of resolve and, or determination. So again, resilience. We've all been through a lot over the last two years. We'll talk more about my own personal experiences shortly. Yeah, we've had to develop and build resilience. Coping mechanisms. It's a form of power, I think. This is probably one of the best quotes I've read of recent times. It's from Thor. He's just released a new book. I'll share a reference to it later. It's called Beyond Ego, and Thor's talking a lot about conscious leadership. Again, something else I'm interested in. Uh, and he's got an inner compass model. Again, lots of similar themes and ideas. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I've you know, bolded out some of the, the key things that speak to me. You know, purpose is a sense of meaningfulness. So I've already talked about in the context of social leadership, the social age. A lot of us are looking to derive meaning from everything. Half if we're not, if we're not able to derive meaning from it, move on. I think we need to turn our attention to something else. In the present moment, it's energy as our fuel. Absolutely love that. Yeah, that's what moves us forward. And when we align, right, we've got to align, we're all about alignment, right? If you don't align, things just don't go well. 
that we are stronger, right? So we get strength from it. That's where power comes from. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. And I think it really captures what I'm trying to say here. With a bit more personal perspective. So yeah, over the last couple of years, lots of things have happened. We've all been through a lot. We've experienced a lot. So 2020, I started a new job. Three weeks in, COVID happened. We're stuff in our own homes. You know, it was quite challenging. Suddenly you were losing that interaction. I was working at the bank at the time, huge organisation. It became quite difficult to navigate this organisation virtually. But I found a way to achieve what I was trying to do, but it, but it, but it wasn't easy. Uh, I run the Future of Work um, Scotland Meetup group. Uh, we used to do local events in Scotland. I took over the leadership of that from Scott, is that right? And um, yeah, we used to do bi-monthly events, everything we're all used to in that space. And again, COVID happened. We pivoted quickly to a, to a virtual model and we did you know, a weekly series over 2020 and we did over 30 events by the end of that. But through that, what we were really trying to do is keep ourselves going, keep ourselves connected, keep everyone else connected, keep the conversations going. So that was kind of my, that was driving me at the time. That was kind of my purpose in all of that. And I got a lot of satisfaction from that. Energised me, fueled me. And from that, you know, we, we later in the, would have been August, 2020, Scott's nodding. Um, a bunch of us got together and had the idea and talked about how would we celebrate and mark the 20th anniversary of Agile since it's a, you know, the, the co-authors originally authored it uh, 20 years ago. And we wanted to create this global platform and bring the, engineering, uh, the Agile community together uh, and surface all the flavours of Agile and give everybody a voice, bringing new voices into the community. Uh, and a lot of us were driven by that. We worked you know, day and night. 24-7 alongside our day jobs, a global community group of volunteers who came together and created this platform. In over, over February in 2021, there were 800 plus events held across the world to mark and celebrate um, 20 years of, of Agile. It was quite an incredible thing to be involved in, be part of. And then I've reflected on it many times. How did that happen? What, what caused that? How could such a thing be achievable? I like the way Elon Musk captures it here. And I think this is really at the heart of it. Passion and purpose scale. Always have, always will. Every movement, every revolution is proof of this fact. Love that. And that's really what, what happened there. Came together, we really wanted to do this thing. We were driven by the purpose of it. We were, I, I mean, just still don't know how we did it, but we did, and it was the purpose that drove us. And that purpose aligned us. And a group of us together, a lot of us didn't know each other from around the world, managed to create this platform. And Gab Gabby was one of our patrons. We had a bunch of wonderful patrons. The whole community came together. Fantastic experience. Closing thoughts. No, these are not, this is not my school academic record. No, 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 no. Uh, yeah. C and two A's. We always have a choice, right? For me, a lot of this stuff is about choosing choice, purpose. We have a purpose. Right? We can choose what that purpose is. We can reflect on it. We can think about it. We can make a choice to reflect on it and review it, challenge our own assumptions, think about where we want to be. It can happen at any, any point in your life. Taking action, right? Making choice. We all have the, we all have the, the option to choose. Then to make, to make a success of anything, we have to act. We have to drive ourselves forward, and again, it's that purpose that does that. But we also need to hold ourselves accountable. We talk about a lot. Accountability is key. We often hear and talk about oh, self-organising teams, self-empowered teams. Yeah, sure, but you don't just let get, let teams go and go away. You go figure it all out. No, there, there were some boundaries, there were some constraints. It's the accountability that be, has to be there that, that, that makes it all work. Uh, and, and this is the way I kind of make sense of it myself. A lot of what I'm talking about. I think I'm getting to the end now. I went quite fast. Wow, I've still got 10 minutes. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, just to close the call to action, really. Have you found your purpose? How might you reflect on that? Because what I've learned, what I've found out is, as I've gone further on in my life and my career, I found my purpose. And I find what motivates me and energises me and the point is when you're driven by your purpose, you're motivated by it and you're letting that lead you, 
you typically do the best, your best work. I feel like I'm doing some of the best work of my career and my life. Um, middle age now, I've been doing this 20 odd years, I talked at the start, and I reflect on what went before and I think about the bits that didn't go right. And I think, well, actually, I, I wasn't driven by purpose. What was really motivating me to do that? And that's where I am now. It's such a, it's such a privileged place to be. And what I didn't talk about earlier that I missed in the previous slide when I was talking about some ref personal reflections is COVID's been hard. COVID's hard for, for, for all of us over, over the last two years. And sadly, I lost someone close. My brother-in-law was, was, was killed by COVID um, in April uh, last year. And uh, he was younger than me. He was 10 days off his 40th birthday. And it was a real, a real eye -opener. It was a shock. Nobody would expect anything like that. Loss is always hard. But there were, there were lessons in that loss. And one of the things I learned was, was, was really, well, you know, t tomorrow, isn't, tomorrow isn't promised, not guaranteed. There's a Hindi phrase that goes, Kalho na ho, and it basically translates into that, you know, tomorrow isn't promised. And what really motivates and drives me is every day I want to give my best. And for the last wee while, that, that's pretty much, you know, what's motivated me. And it's worked really well for me. Everyone's got to find their own, their own angle, their own motivators, their own fuel. And, that, and that's really what a lot of this came from, those reflections that I had over what was a very hard year, 2021. Yeah, so if you've not found it, it's never too late. But that inquiry framework that I showed earlier might be one way that you might explore it. And just for further reading, uh, so I talked earlier about social, the social age, social leadership. Uh, that's Julian's book. Uh, I've read it a few times. It's inspired um, a lot of my work over the last couple of years. Um, it's fantastic, and it goes into a lot more detail than I can in this 30-minute in this slot. The middle one's new, so the inquiry framework I touched on earlier. That's, that's from this Power and Potential guidebook. Julian's written countless books. They're fantastic. I'd encourage you to read them. Very powerful, very accessible, easy to read. I find them very inspiring. I find his work very inspiring. And I talked earlier, I, took, I pinched that quote from Thor earlier. That's from his new book that's just come out this month. Beyond Ego, and again, he's talking about conscious leadership, and he's talking about his inner compass and how, you know, if we can kind of handle and manage our, our, our ego, that's a very powerful place to be. If we can't, it can often get in, way, in the way of and dilute our purpose. So yeah, really, really great stuff. All great reads, I'd recommend them. I think that's me. Questions? Yeah, have you got a podcast? Yeah, I'll do one with you. <laughs> Making community. <laughs> Where can you find that? I haven't got a link. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. I really enjoyed sharing that. Um, I hope you got some value out of that. Thank you for your time. If you want to stay in touch, you can reach me through all these um, different channels. As I say, I'm, I'm working with David and others on the BCS Agile Methods, LinkedIn, uh, Future Work, and uh, I, I tweet from time to time. Question. Brilliant. That comes up all the time. Because there's a, the, the point is, and I couldn't get into it in this talk, but it was in my previous one, the complementary. So what we're seeing is in hierarchical traditional organisations, you, you've got all that bureaucracy. And you always need a level of hierarchy to understand, but we're seeing flatter organisations. But the point is, in a lot of cases now in organisations, the, the, the formal messaging, the formal leadership doesn't always work. It doesn't land. The narrative doesn't work, so that's where your social leadership comes in to complement that and subvert that, where formal styles of leadership don't work. That is actually in my previous talk, and I talk about that in, in greater depth. But you need both. They're complementary. You're always going to have a level of formal leadership, but that isn't really working as well as it did in the past, and there's lots of good reasons for that. And the social leadership comes and gives you those informal spaces. And the point of social leadership is Social leaders are just those who are exhibiting the right behaviour. They didn't become leaders through, you know, some hierarchy or, you know, it's not power that's just granted to them. Like I talked about earlier, that their power comes from the purpose that drives them and, and their ability to create the right narrative and make that narrative land. They're powerful storytellers. And again, they're not, they're not looking for power. They're, they're looking to achieve stuff through purpose. Sometimes formal organisations and hierarchical structures Sadly, it isn't purpose that's always driving it. So in my organisation, we're purpose-led. 
you know, we champion potential. That's one of the things we say. A lot of my own personal work in the voluntary space, that's a lot what I do. I try to inspire others, I try to support others. We talked in the inquiry framework. And uh, I think the second one, uh, talking about, you know, what harm can we prevent? Uh, a few years ago, uh, I burnt out. I suffered burnout. Eventually, I realised what it was. It took a long time. And then when I'm coaching and mentoring others, there's a chap that I did mentor for a while, and he nearly went through the same thing. But I saw the signs. So I was able to intervene and give him some advice, and, and then he found a way through it. So I, was, I had that power and opportunity to prevent some harm. I talked about it earlier in the inquiry framework. Good, good question. But I've got another talk that talks more about that. <laughs> Anything else? Arun. Yeah, good question. Um, so the way the way I've done it in my organisation, again, is through create the narrative. So create the narrative, think about what you're trying to achieve, use the purpose to drive it, tell the stories, get the messages out there. And if it's a powerful, compelling message, it gets amplified by the communities through which you share it. That's how it works. That's how I've used it, and I've found it to, to work quite effectively in the things I'm trying to do across, you know, thousands and thousands of communities of engineers. Uh, and, and that's the way, it, it's all about the storytelling and the power of it. If it's compelling, it lands, you're in, as they say, by my part of the world. <laughs> so, does that help? Yeah. Anything else? Two minutes. I got to the end. Any last burning questions? You always need a level of structure. There's always a level of structure required in organisations that support some of the traditional things, especially in large organisations. I mean, I'm, I'm in a regulated, you know, financially regulated organisation, I'm in a bank. So there's always going to be some structure, there's always going to be a level of hierarchy. I think the organisations that we see excelling and those that have true agility have flatter structures, which lowers the, you know, the, 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 the sort of amount of kind of communication handoffs, I guess. But you're always going to need a level of structure. Right? You can't have no structure. I don't know how well that would work. Maybe you can, I don't know. Maybe that's a future talk. <laughs> Anybody else got a view on that? Not really. On that question? Um, I think we've got to. Does, does your purpose change? It does. Well, my purpose has changed. Um, that's what I was, was talking about. I think our purpose continues to change. It's whether we notice. It's whether we reflect on that. How does that show up? So I guess all I'm trying to encourage is take the time to reflect on that. You know, have you found it? Do you understand what it is? If you have, fantastic. Maybe you've not. And you might want to use some of these tools and techniques to try to surface it. That's really, that's ultimately all I'm trying to say. <laughs>